as the tone moves away from you, the waves get stretched. So when things move towards you, the frequency increases. When the waves move away from you, the frequency decreases. Because what you're hearing is the wave front, the compression, as the wave is moving towards you, it makes a wave. And it makes a wave. And it makes a wave. And it makes a wave. So the wave fronts are closer together. Your ears detect that as an increase in frequency. As the waves are moving away from you, it makes a wave, moves away, makes a wave, moves away, makes a wave. The waves get further away, and your ears detect that as a decrease in frequency. Exactly. You ask any toddler what sound a race car makes, and what do they tell you? Yeah. They say, they say vroom or meow or woom, but there's always two sounds. Yeah. Kachow. Kachuga. Kachuga. How many times have I seen that movie in the last year? Um, <laughs> You're in for it now, Whipple Filter. It's the third one. <laughs> it's a great movie. Okay, so, so anyway, um, yeah. So you ask any toddler what sound a race car makes, and they always give you two syllables. They give you this. Yeah. So as the thing moves towards you, you get the ver. As the thing moves away from you, you get the um. Ver um. So as it moves towards you, you get the ver. As it moves away from you, it gets the um. And you get the kachow. <laughs> okay, so write down what you want to write down. I want to move on. I'll show you something. What happens when you take this moving towards and moving away from you to the extreme? When you actually move near the speed of sound? That's exactly what we're going to be talking about. So as something is moving towards you, now this could be the source moving towards you, or it could be you moving towards the source. Or it could be moving away from the source or it moving away. Now there is some math involved that you do not have to do. This is one more thing, Doppler effect is one more thing that the AP needs you to know, but doesn't have you calculate. Okay. So one more thing, they need you to know what the Doppler effect is, but they don't have you do any math with it. Okay, shall we move on? Not yet. Okay, not yet. What's coming up is one of my favorite slides. So oh, I hope the videos work. We have a new computer. Higher, but they're not higher. Yeah, again, just like with, remember how we talked about waves interfering with each other? The individual waves, when they interfere, they don't change. But as an observer, we notice the amplitudes have, have summed. And that's what's going on. We're the observer. We're noticing that the wave fronts are getting closer, but the waves actually aren't changing. Isn't there a Doppler effect for color? Like if something's moving mm -hmm. really fast, it's red or blue? Um, it doesn't seem red or blue. And if a star is moving away from us, yeah. then the light will actually get stretched out, and it's what's called red shifted. Yeah, yeah. And when stars are moving towards us, they're called blue shifted. They don't look blue or red. All stars look white. Um, but their frequencies are all shifted a little bit. Okay. Shifted towards the red, towards the blue. Okay. But yeah, and it has to be stars. Um, spaceships wouldn't do it. Even, even like comets and planets don't do it. It has to be stars that are moving at several hundred thousand meters per second. <laughs> okay, so imagine, guys, imagine you're in a pool and you make a splash and your waves travel out like this. Now imagine you're moving forward and make a splash. And moving forward and make a splash. See so bad AJ's not here, he could talk about this. So he makes a splash and he swims forward and makes a splash and swims forward. So anybody else swim in here? Okay, so you swim, you, yeah. So swim, splash, swim, splash, swim, splash. And as you catch up to each splash, you make another splash. So the wave fronts of your splashes 
pile up. Now imagine you could swim as fast as the water moves. What would happen? Where, if you made a splash and then swam forward, when you put your hands down, what are you hitting? You're hitting the wave you just made. And you're like, boom, and the wave gets bigger. And then you swim forward and you go, boom, and the wave gets even bigger. And you keep hitting the wave you just made, and this is what it's going to look like. It's going to look like this. Yeah. So you're moving faster than the wave you made, and you're hitting your splash. Now, if we're talking about an airplane, airplanes make noise. You might have heard there's, airplanes make a lot of noise. There's a lot of combustion going on. What are these? What are represented by? Yeah. What are represented by these black rings? Sound waves. So what are sound waves? What are they made of? They're molecules that have been what? Compressed together. They're molecules that have been compressed together. Well, if you compress a lot of molecules and compress a lot of molecules and compress a lot of molecules and compress a lot of molecules, if you compress a lot of nitrogen, guess what happens to nitrogen? Explodes. No, it liquefies. Wow. You ever, see, ever seen liquid nitrogen? Yeah. That's how they make it. They squish, 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 and then you get liquid nitrogen and you pour it in your pool. And so if you compress a gas and compress a gas and compress a gas and compress a gas, it liquefies. So why is it a bad idea if your airline or pilot travels faster than the speed of sound? It would be a lot like flying through liquid. The density of that air would be so high, it would be like them flying through liquid, which, I don't know about you, doesn't seem like a good idea. It makes a plane submarine. A plane submarine. <laughs> now, how can jets do it? Jets push through, they are designed to push through that high density air. And when they push through the high density air, they create this pattern, and this is called a mock cone. Now, once again, this is one area that has math, but the AP does not, want, does not care about you knowing the math. The math requires geometry. Who likes to do circle geometry? That's what I thought. Um, so you don't have to do any circle geometry. All you need to know is that a mock cone makes this crazy triangle. Yeah. They used to require si uh, math. They used to require physics students to like do the geometry and like based on a 45 degree mock cone, how fast is an object traveling? You're like, ugh. Um, so we don't do that anymore. That's exactly. It's named after a guy named Ernest Mach, and uh, the Mach number is basically a very a, a multiple of the speed of sound wherever you are. So wait, Mach two is like double the sound. Exactly. Mach two is twice the speed of sound wherever you are. Mach 3 is th three times the speed of sound wherever you are. So wait, what's the fastest, yeah, what's like, the fastest plane? plane Mach, the fastest plane is the space shuttle. As it enters the, as it enters the atmosphere, it's traveling about Mach 10. Wow. Yeah. Um, which is why it needs those plates, because it's going from ridiculously fast, I can go as fast as I want because there's no air in space, to, oh my gosh, there's all this air, I'm traveling way faster than the speed of sound, which produces a tremendous amount of air. And the crazy thing about the space shuttle is it actually breaks the sound barrier three or four times as it falls. Because it keeps breaking it, speeding up, speeding up and breaking it, and speeding up and breaking it. It's kind of like if you kept pulling, pull, pulling parachutes. You can slow down and slow down and slow down. So the as it as it would fall, it would break the sound barrier multiple times. Like it breaks the sound barrier, it slows down. It breaks mm -hmm. it yep. Okay. Um, what's the fastest non-space shuttle like? What's the the that's? that's trivia that I do not know. Um, I can tell you that the SR-71, which is that profile that was launched in the 70s, um, it was used as a spy plane. It flew over Soviet Russia, Soviet the Soviet Union. Um, and it was like, you can't catch us, nainer, nainer, nainer. Um, traveled at 3.2 Mach. So the idea was there was no missile that could catch it. And the Soviets spent billions of dollars just to develop a missile fast enough to shoot it down. And, there, and then when they did, we're like, that's OK. We don't need to use it anymore. We have satellites. So uh, true story. <laughs> we, we made this really cool plane. They invented a really cool missile. So we in launched satellites. So we spent a lot of money for no reason, tax dollars. This is how the Cold War worked. We, but, but this is this is why we have GPS. So there's, okay. 
It would appear my really cool computer is not going to show the video. Oh. Okay. Let's see if we're going to. Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, there it is. Okay. Zoom. Now it's right here. Okay. This is, guys. Um, this is from a VHS. Remember those those big plastic boxy tapes? Yeah. Um, so this is a VHS recording that was shot about 20 years ago of an, an F-14 breaking the sound barrier. And there's a couple interesting things that you can see about it. Let's see, where's my mouse? I'm getting used to this new computer. Boom! He breaks it twice. So he basically, he breaks it, then he, he slows down, hits his afterburner, and breaks it again. And uh, hopefully all those officers are wearing ear protection. I, I do that when I run all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, he means he means ejecting hot gases. Um, okay. First and foremost, this is the mock cone right here, right there, um, and this is actually a, there's a little cloud next to his his cockpit because his cockpit goes over a little bit, so his cockpit breaks the sound barrier first. But um, his engines and his planes make that mock cone. The question I have for you is this. Are you seeing in this cloud the compression or the rarefaction? You're seeing the rarefaction. The compression is right here. Now, you, if you ever watched um, weather, which I know you do, you watch weather, um, you open up your phone and it says, oh, the phone says it's going to be a high pressure day. A high pressure day means what kind of weather? Wow, the things smartphones do to you. Okay, well, in my day, you'd see a weather report, and it would have an H and an L, and an H would mean, oh, good, they make the H's red, because high pressure means the clouds have been burned off, and you're going to get a nice sunny day. A low pressure day means the clouds were able to be created. Um, anyone ever popped soda and seen a little poof of cloud come out of the soda? That's happening because of the, the rapid drop in pressure of the soda. So what you're seeing here is actually the rarefaction. The massive drop in pressure is causing the water molecules to create a cloud. And then they immediately evaporate. Question? What's a high pressure in inches of mercury? About 30. 30? So yeah. today would be high pressure, so it's 30.3? My guess, yeah. It's 30.3 today? That's what it says on Yeah, the that's board. very high pressure. Um, okay, let's see if I can close this again and get back to my PowerPoint. Okay, questions before we move on? Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were really good at math. They knew. Um, Keep in mind, they, the, the space shuttle wasn't the first thing to fall out of orbit. We've been dropping stuff out of orbit since the 50s. Um, so, yeah, they knew. Okay. <laughs> I, wish I, could, I wish I could have the sound for this one. So, anyone ever done this before? You're just watching the puppy. Um, so acoustic resonance is what I was doing with, this, with the rods. And he's doing the same thing here um, with a little bit of water and on the edge of a, a glass. You can vibrate it. And basically, the, the glass will vibrate. And a standing wave will build up inside the glass um, for the same reason, slip stick resonance. As you move around, your finger is constantly slipping and sticking and slipping and sticking. You don't notice it. All you feel is the friction. And that's producing energy, which goes into the wave, which or goes into the thing. Well, ideally, you don't break the glass. But uh, if you do, I recommend you abandon the, the emission. OK, now, we have two types of instruments, closed pipes and open pipes. My whistle is a closed pipe. OK, I'm adding energy at one end. Where I add energy will be an anti-node. Okay. I'm adding energy and I'm creating an anti-node at the open end of the whistle. The other end is going to be a solid fixed point. 
That's why it's called a closed end. Most instruments are not closed ends. Um, most instruments are open pipes, but this one's a closed pipe. It has a little plunger. Okay, so notice what's happening as I'm moving the plunger, I'm changing the size of my closed pipe. Well, it turns out the wavelength that comes out of a closed pipe varies with the size of the device. So specifically, mathematically, there's even, it's an equal sign, not even a varies with, the wavelength that comes out of a closed pipe instrument is four times the size of the device. We're gonna do my favorite lab either, I hope it's gonna be tomorrow, either tomorrow or, or Friday, depending on how much we get done today. I might just put everything off. You know what, I'll put everything off. I'm doing my favorite lab tomorrow. Tomorrow we're gonna do a lab that is the simplified version of something I did at Oregon State, and I gotta love to tell you the story. I'll tell you the story tomorrow. Uh, Noah, you had a question? Yeah, is that way too because they're huge, so they have to have a high wavelength? Exactly. That's why if you wanna make a really low tone, you gotta have a big instrument. Whether it be a bass guitar, a cello, or you know, a, a tuba. Okay, so a closed pipe traps a lot of energy, so it's not very efficient, but it does allow you to make instruments. So I have my closed end going back and forth. <whistles> Whistles are closed pipes. Okay, so in a closed pipe, you have an anti-node here and a node where the energy bounces back. In an open pipe, you have an anti-node in both places. Most instruments are, anti, are, are open pipes and strings act like open pipes, but their sound, their waveforms are exactly the opposite. And I'll show you what I mean like that in a second. And this is probably where we're gonna end. Yeah, this is where we're gonna end today. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna try my best to draw waves, and it's not easy. But I will tell you that I've never found a physics teacher that actually can actually draw these properly, so if you're happy, then I'm happy. Here we go. Okay. I'm gonna stop that wave. Now, from here, at the beginning of the wave, actually this, this is the middle of the wave, so here's the equilibrium point going through the wave, there. Okay, so if my wave starts here, where does it complete an entire wavelength? Tell me to stop. Right here? Okay, so right there, that's one lambda, from there to there. Okay, so far so good? Yeah. Now, if you have a node here, and an anti-node here and an anti-node here, how much of a wave do you have in an open pipe? <coughs> you have half the wave in an open pipe, okay? So if you have an anti-node and an anti-node, then right here to right here is what you have in a uh, open pipe. You have an open pipe, gets you half the wave. So far so good? So how is it able to make an entire wave? It bounces back. What is more dense? Air that's been squished or air that's not moving at all? <coughs> squished air. Squished air is more dense. So when the wave, which is an anti-node here, a node there and an anti-node there, when it hits the end of the air, it runs out of squished air, some of that wave energy comes back. Some does, does get transmitted, a lot gets transmitted, so you have to blow really hard most of the time, but a lot of energy comes back. And what comes back is gonna be upright or inverted? Upright, okay. So here's where things get a little weird. In this part of the wave, when it gets to this point, is that wave energy traveling up or traveling down? In other words, is it traveling towards the equilibrium point or traveling away from the equilibrium point? 
it's traveling towards. So the wave that comes back will also be traveling towards. Does that make sense? No, because the wave energy here, I drew it, I drew it on the other side just to give you an illustration. You can, you can trace it over again if you want. But I drew it here because the wave energy is on its way back to the equilibrium. So that means that the wave that gets reflected should also be on its way back to the equilibrium point. Can you see the full wave? Yeah. Then mission accomplished for the front row. How about the back row? Can you see the entire wave in a closed pipe? Yeah. Okay. Now, in a string, you get the exact opposite situation. In a string, you have a node and a node with an anti-node in the middle. Okay. With a string, the fundamental wave looks like that. This is what we're going to be investigating on Friday. We're going to look at the string waves. Okay. Can you see the difference? But you still get the replication of the half wave. So a string and an open pipe both, are, both produce a wave that's twice the size of the instrument. And now here's a tricky one. Amplitude, or sorry, antinode to node, it strikes it. It strikes a more, density bound, more dense boundary. Brass is more dense than air. Stri strikes a more dense boundary, so it comes back inverted. inverted. Which means it looks, this is on its way down, towards the, or it's on its way from, away from the equilibrium. You have to draw a wave towards the equilibrium. And not, I'm not even going to try. Because I want to get your, your uh, I'm, I can't, the, the, understand that there are four parts in a closed wave. The wave bounces four times in order to create the entire wave. Does that make sense? I can't. I'm just, because I'll get them out of order. It's like, okay, this one has to be this way, and another one has to be this way, and another one has to be uh, this, from here to this way. Okay. Four quarters. It makes four quarters of a wave. Okay, so that's a great place to stop. We'll, uh, we'll pick this up again tomorrow. I do have a little worksheet for you. So...